we've been working on this review for about 10 months. That's been long enough to really get to know the Fuji X-T2, the second generation offspring of the very successful X-T1. But let me back up to my first impression. I've not liked a camera this much since the Sony a6000 landed on my desk, and waiting 10 months means that this review includes the version 2 firmware, a comprehensive across-the-board upgrade that extends the camera's abilities and improves some of the shortcomings I'd identified earlier on. And in the interest of full disclosure, Fuji has given me the X-T2 along with a couple of lenses for an extended loan. In exchange, I'm helping them with some video productions for their channel. Fuji's film heritage and its unique control set excels at stills. The addition of 4K video brings the X-T2 to a competitive position in the mirrorless class. I'm pretty excited about the video functionality, a big step forward for Fuji. I'm also excited about the optional battery grip. But let's get started with three features, the vertically articulated screen, the new autofocus continuous settings, and the burst speed. Although the screen is a little clunky and unlatching is tricky, if you're shooting portrait mode low to the ground like Omar Z. Robles does with his X-T2, you'll find it a useful feature. Not as useful as full selfie swivel maybe, but there are five pre-programmed and one customized autofocus continuous modes. I've not always been satisfied with Fuji's focus engine, but the combination of features, functions, and speed in the X-T2 are world class. I've complained about Fuji autofocus in the past, but no more. The X-T2 is a solid performer, although the continuous modes do require some familiarization and practice. Regardless of make or manufacture, I've always used manual focus for video. The X-T2's autofocus continuous feature, combined with the joystick focus selection, which is improved with firmware 2, allows me to shoot handheld interviews with AF continuous. I would not have dared to do that before. Combine that with a truly fast burst mode, managed with the collar under the left side ISO dial, CH high and CL low. The menu, drive setting option, sets the speeds for low and high. By default, low, 3 to 5, high, 8. Change from mechanical to electronic shutter to enable 11 and 14. Shooting 24 megapixel fine JPEGs in manual exposure, continuous autofocus in performance boost mode, I clocked 14 shots per second for 3 seconds slowing to slightly less than 8 per second, a total of 400 shots in 60 seconds, and it's completely silent. If you're worried about electronic shutter image shear, the mechanical shutter clocks 8 per second for 22 seconds before slowing to about 5 per. At that point, a pronounced flicker appears on the screen, a total of 370 images in a minute. With the performance boosting battery grip, about 11 per second for 5 seconds before slowing to 5 per. Could use a bigger buffer, but still, standout burst performance. Performance boost without the battery grip is selected from the setup menu power management. Select boost to increase autofocus performance, increase the viewfinder rate to 100 frames per second from 60, and increase the viewfinder display quality. Of course, there's an impact on battery life. The battery grip, which has its own boost switch, increases mechanical burst to 11 frames and minimally reduces release lag. Fuji, with good reason, is very confident of this camera and are inviting comparison to full frame models. Well, it's not a full frame sensor, but in nearly every other way, it is a solid and capable competitor, particularly for video which has not been a Fuji strength in the past. I'll get to that in a minute. It's not particularly small or light compared, say, to other mirrorless cameras. The body is 460 grams before battery and memory card. Like other Fujis, it's solid with clean lines and pro styling, particularly with the control dials. The sensor is APS-C 24 megapixel CMOS, Excellent and detailed image quality compares favorably to higher-end models from other brands, including full frame. I don't have the models for side-by-side -side comparison, so check Tony Northrup, link in the description below. 
Fuji provided the XF 18-55 kit lens, as well as the XF 16-55 and 50-140 lenses. The kit is a reliable performer, and its size and weight had me select it for long days on holiday but the constant f2.8 16-55 has a marked iris adjustment ring, which I much prefer. The entire control set on this camera makes it a delight to use. The ability to set ISO, shutter, and iris physically and manually is particularly nice. The drive mode caller, that's where you'll find movie mode, works nicely, but the meter mode caller under the shutter dial is brilliant. It makes it possible to change the meter really easily, and I learned to take advantage of that, changing and using the meter in situations where I used to ignore it. ISO and shutter can be locked by pressing the center button down. It's nice to have this as a toggle, as opposed to a lock that needs to be pressed at the same time that the dial is turned. Add the joystick focus point, and the fact that the menu button is the center of the control dial, it truly is easy to use. It only took me a few days to realize that I don't really like a PASM mode dial and to get fully used to this control set. Those modes are all there, just watch the bottom left. For P, set both the aperture and the shutter to A. For aperture priority, change the aperture. For shutter priority, change the shutter. For manual, change both. But what you don't get are scene modes. One thing, by default, Fuji does not display the image just taken. It's an interesting non-chimping kind of attitude. Turn the review on in Screen Setup, Image Disp. Both one half and one and half are kind of short. Continuous displays the image until the shutter is soft pressed. The viewfinder is large and bright and rotates when you turn the camera to portrait mode. And in firmware 2, that rotation happens on the LCD too. There's plenty of diopter range, and the dedicated view mode switch beside the viewfinder is very useful. Eye sensor switches automatically. There are EVF and LCD only modes, as well as EVF with eye detect to conserve battery, and an EVF where the image you've just taken appears on the LCD, like a DSLR, but only when you remove your eye from the viewfinder. Pretty sure no one else offers that level of flexibility. Well, let's go back to the focus settings. The switch beside the lens selects manual, continuous, or single. In classic grip, it's perfectly positioned to switch with my thumb. Although I'm still reminding myself single up, I can control it without moving my eye from the finder. In single, you'll find the option to use 91 or 325 focus points. At 325, nearly the entire screen is covered in a 13 by 25 grid. The larger center squares use both phase and contrast, the sides only contrast detection. In single, the spot can be sized with the dial and moved with the joystick. That's a feature I'm finding exceptionally useful. Firmware 2 added a smaller, more precise spot size. Worth noting that the X-T2 reverts to 91 in zone and wide tracking modes, and in video. The joystick controller, which controls the focus spot, is one of my favorite features, an excellent substitute for a touchscreen. It's so easy to move the spot, which makes single and spot much simpler to use. Zone provides 3x3, 5x5, and 7x7 areas. Wide tracking covers the screen with active focus spots, which lock in single, but dance in continuous focus mode. Face Detect, on page 2 of the focus menu, can do face or face plus eye, and includes the ability to select the left or right eye. With firmware 2, Face Detect now also uses phase detection. A very interesting addition is the independent focus settings for landscape and portrait orientations. The setting can apply to the area only or area and mode when on is selected. In manual, there's a distance ruler, which includes a blue area to display the depth of field. Note that it changes as I adjust the iris. Fuji provides three manual focus assist modes, the standard expanded view, Press the rear dial and turn for two magnifications. With firmware 2, the area can be moved while you're in expanded view. Press and hold the rear dial for digital split image, 
a focus technique that takes me back to the 80s, and focus peaking. Set peaking color and level using the menu. Oh, one more thing. In manual focus, there's an additional display mode. A second window is the expanded view of the focus point. Very useful. Wish that worked in video mode. ISO ranges from 200 to 12.8, set by turning the dial, which also has auto, high, and low settings. L ranges from 100 to 160, with a lower dynamic range. H is 25.6 or 51.2. These are configured using setup, button dial setting, ISO dial setting L to set 100, 125, or 160, H to 25.6 or 51.2. The setup menu is somewhat oblique, making this an obscure setting. Auto ISO, particularly when it's available with manual shutter and aperture, is a feature that combines aperture and shutter control with auto exposure for a powerful assist. Use the camera menu to set up the three auto ISO ranges with default and maximum ISO as well as the triggering shutter speed. This setting also selects which of the three is active when the ISO dial is at A. For faster access, and this is new in firmware too, go back to the button dial setting, ISO dial settings, and change from auto to command. Now, the front dial can select the entire ISO range, high, low, and all three auto settings. I find this particularly helpful when recording video. Although the changes aren't smooth, it's much easier than finding and turning the ISO dial. The shutter dial has settings from 1 second to 1 over 8,000 in addition to auto. And if the setting isn't granular enough, turn the back dial for the intermediate steps between. By default, the shutter is mechanical, but it can optionally be set to electronic or combined. A mechanical shutter goes up to 1 8,000th, the electronic shutter to 1 over 32,000th accessed by turning the back dial. There are two more settings on the shutter dial, T and B. Timer, the T setting, enables the back dial to access a range of extended shutter opening times from 1 second to 15 minutes. Granularity is reasonable up to 1 minute, then 2, 4, 8, and 15 minutes. A countdown timer displays on screen. Bulb, the B setting, opens the shutter as long as the shutter button is held down up to 60 minutes for long exposures. With manual settings, use the meter on screen left to set exposure. I prefer this graphical display to a numerical readout. With auto ISO and auto shutter or aperture, the same display shows the exposure value adjustment, set by the dial on the top right. It brightens when not at zero, a feature I wish applied to the exposure meter mode as well. Using the dial, EV range is three stops, plus or minus. Turn the dial to C, and use the front dial to adjust with a five-stop range. I prefer the C setting, as it's more noticeable if I accidentally adjust it. Note that if you have assigned ISO to the front dial, you have to press it to switch between ISO and EV functions. You can tell which mode you're in by looking for the half blue circle. It's either above the ISO setting or the EV meter. Press the right button on the control pad for white balance. In addition to auto and the presets, set degrees Kelvin, or create and save up to three custom settings. Press right, point at a white card, press the shutter to capture, OK to set. Then OK to create a custom color shift, a 19 by 19 grid with red, green, and blue amber axes. And that's only the start of Fuji's color management options. The bottom row of the Q menu has highlight, shadow, color, and sharpness controls. Although the range is not dramatic, I find it useful, particularly for video. But the star of the show are Fuji's film simulations. And note that all three of these can be combined, white balance, Q menu, and film simulation. These are named by reference to Fuji's analog film types. My preference, particularly for video, is Chrome. There's the Fuji Acros Mono with four variations, which are also available in a standard black and white setting. There's a grain effect with weak and strong settings, and although the rest are, grain is not available in video mode. 
Finally, although gimmicky, Fuji does include some filter modes. Turn the drive dial to Add, and use the camera menu Drive option to choose. If you are going to use these, probably best to add them to the Q menu for easier access. And for all of these settings, when shooting RAW plus JPEG, the effect is applied to the JPEG, the companion RAW file is clean. Also at this end of the drive dial are multi-exposure. Take the first image, if it's good, OK lets you take the next, while the first displays. OK to finish. And at the far end of the dial, panorama. On-screen prompts to set the direction and the angle. M is 2160 by 6400 pixels. L, 2160 by 9600. At the other end of the drive dial are the extensive bracket modes. Brackets, another submenu of the drive settings, can be created for exposure, ISO, film simulation, white balance, and dynamic range. The exposure bracket has options for the number of frames, up to 9, and the range from 1 3rd to 3 stops. The bottom of the screen shows both. Note that there are options just to bracket up or down, as well as the typical up and down. The camera can shoot bracket automatically, continuous, or one shot at a time. One more drive mode is a menu option, self-timer. 2 or 10 seconds, but with an Easter egg. If you leave the drive mode in either burst setting, it will take five images. An intervalometer sets the time between exposures and can take up to infinity images, if your SD card can hold infinity images. Although there's no in-camera ability to create time-lapse videos, those images can be used to create time-lapse videos of up to 6K resolution. The default display variations include a histogram only on the viewfinder companion screen, but it's also available as an overlay. Activated from Setup, Screen Setup, Page 2, Display Custom Setting, which contains all of the items over four pages that can be displayed. So this is an opportunity to remove icons that aren't useful and add those like Histogram and Horizontal Level that are. The histogram can't be sized or moved. But with Firmware 2, it does appear in video mode. Up to seven custom settings can be created and retrieved using the Q menu. Edit and save from the IQ menu, page 3. They primarily control image quality settings. Now, I'm not in the habit of using custom settings, mostly because I can't remember which is which. In Firmware 2, the custom settings can be saved and named. Maybe that will help me. Sadly, these custom settings can't be retrieved in video mode. Some of Fuji's lenses have optical stabilization, but there's no in-body stabilization here, a feature that is quickly becoming standard on the competition. And sadly, no zebra display, a nice exposure settings feature to have, particularly for video. The X-T2 comes with the EF-X8 flash unit, which mounts on the hot shoe. The menu includes extensive flash support to manage external flashes wirelessly. You can see that in a video I did with Billy, one of the Fuji guys. The X-T2 has two SD card slots. Both support the UHS Type 2 cards. There are menu settings to control how the cards are used, sequential, backup for dual recording, and split recording, RAW on one, JPEG on the other. While we're here, note that video can only be recorded on one card. You'll have to manually switch when it fills up. More about video after this break. Fuji has never seemed to be very interested in video. It seemed to me that they didn't want to ignore it entirely, but preferred to focus primarily on stills. All that's changed. There are a few quirks and some features I'd love to have, but I'm happy to recommend the X-T2 for video. The X-T2 shoots 4K, provides live HDMI out with F-Log, and provides a standard audio in jack and level controls. Access video mode from the drive dial, that changes the aspect ratio of the display, crops the sensor, and adds an audio meter display. It also switches the shutter release to a start-stop button. There's no audible sound to confirm either the start or end of recording. I kind of like that confirmation on cameras that provide it. 
The dedicated movie setting menu offers 4K or 2160 at 24, 25, and 30 frames with drop frame available at 24 and 30 if that's a distinction that's important to you. Sadly, only 16x9 UHD, not the 17x9 Cinema 4K. There are also 1080 and 720 resolutions at the same frame rates as well as 50 and 60. Output settings provide internal recording on SD at about 100 megabits. External on HDMI with and without F-Log, Fuji's dynamic range enhancing setting. And that works nicely with the Atomos Shogun. I took the X-T2 and Shogun to DSC Labs for a test on the Xyla chart. Each rectangle to the right is one f-stop lower brightness. Both internal and external recordings reveal about 8 steps of range. Using the F-Log setting, about 12 stops of range, a useful capability. F-Log is most useful for shooting in situations where there is a wide range in brightness, and then turning that back to the 8 stops are display support in editing. Now, for the moment, no extended color settings, which will be useful as our 4K TV sets adopt both expanded dynamic range and extended color capabilities. Before recording, Top Center displays the amount of time available on the card at the current setting. While recording, the display counts down. 4K clips are limited to 10 minutes, HD to 15, 720 to 30. With the optional battery grip, all modes go to 30 minutes. Files record in 4 GB chunks, even on SDXC cards. The chunks are about 5 minutes each. They edit seamlessly, and they're in the same folder as the still image files. I've never had the X-T2 overheat in real-world recording situations, and while testing in a 24 degrees Celsius room, the overheating icon appeared just before a 64 GB card filled up. That's about 80 minutes of recording time. With firmware 2, the eye sensor can switch the display from LCD to viewfinder while recording. There's a menu option to turn the on-screen info overlay on and off. And to enable external record control, so pressing the record button on the camera starts and stops the Shogun recording. That standard audio in jack means you don't need Fuji's proprietary shotgun mic. I used both a simple wireless lav, my Rodelink filmmaker kit, and I also mounted the Tascam DR70D for multi-mic inputs. Although the setting range did improve with firmware 2, when recording from the mic or the mixer, input levels need to be turned down to 2 or 3 to avoid compression and clipping. The X-T2 has become my go-to video camera, but I don't take advantage of F-Log much. I don't always want to drag an external recorder along. I am hoping that internal F-Log recording is added in the next firmware update. Now, in order to create a softer and more cinematic image, I use the Q screen to reduce the highlight and shadow tones, as well as the color and sharpness settings. For me, that produces the most pleasant image and requires little adjustment in post. The sensor is somewhat susceptible to rolling shutter, but unless you're panning quickly across vertical lines, not really noticeable. There are no Fuji X-mount Cine lenses, yet, and I shot primarily with the more versatile 16-55. to Zooms are smooth with less than a quarter ring travel tight to wide. It may not be parfocal, but it is very stable. There are 91 focus points available in video mode. Face detect is not available in 4K video. It is available in HD. Autofocus continuous follows the focus point, but using this technique may inadvertently focus on an unintended object while you're moving the point. It is focused by wire and these lenses don't have focus ring markings, which makes a rack focus difficult. Here's my workaround. On the setup menu, use button dial setting, fun AEL AFL setting, and set the AFL button to AF on, the back focus button. On the movie menu, set movie AF mode to area. Use the cursor to move, the button to focus. The transition isn't as smooth as I'd like, and it would also be nice to be able to set the speed of the focus transition, maybe in the next firmware upgrade. There's no built-in ND, 
and the 16 to 55 77 millimeter filter diameter is rather larger than anything in my kit but ND is necessary to maintain a large aperture while shooting a video outside for a shallow depth of field. I bought the 77 millimeter ND for a project I shot with Paul Marshman last fall. In video mode there's no extended ISO and shutter won't go lower than 1 over the frame rate, the typical 180 shutter. Well, how good are the high ISO settings? Here's the one candle shot at 6400 and at 12.8. Not ideal, but certainly usable. And don't forget that all of Fuji's film emulations are available in video. At low light, the Acros black and white setting is particularly pleasing. As with other cameras, custom white balance can't be captured in movie mode. Although it's possible to set the shutter speed and lock it with the top dial, the back dial still offers a small adjustment, which means I found myself shooting at 1 40th unintentionally. Use the menu to reverse these so the shutter's in front and less likely to be accidentally adjusted, or disable shutter adjustments altogether using the adjacent menu item. If you're shooting video, consider the battery grip a must-have accessory, particularly for 4K, where it unlocks the ability to shoot 30-minute segments instead of just 10. With two batteries in the grip, as well as one in the body, an individual status for all three on screen, a full day of shooting video is easily managed. Very simple installation. Remove the cap from the bottom and turn the dial to lock it on. Most of the controls are replicated for easy portrait mode shooting, front and rear dials, AE and AF lock buttons, focus point joystick. The grip also adds a headphone jack, the essential mate to a mic input. And it comes with a charging cable that charges the batteries in the grip and powers the camera. LEDs indicate which battery is charging. Although I do find the weatherproof door to the charging and headphone port tricky to open. However, Switching batteries isn't exactly seamless. As one battery runs out, the video recording stops, and it does so without an alert. You can start recording again immediately, but you've got to keep your eyes on the ball or you'll miss it. Fuji's free Wi-Fi smartphone app is simple and effective. It provides image transfer, remote shooting, and transfers GPS data from the phone to the camera. My biggest complaint is that it insists on dropping the connection to switch modes. Select the camera's ad hoc Wi-Fi network from phone or tablet. There's no password, so be careful out there. Select Receive, press OK on the camera to transmit, and done. For remote control, connection can be initiated from the camera menu. Both stills and video are supported, with a limited but reasonable set of controls. Press the big red button to snap or record. There's touch focus for stills, but not for video. The remote control is the most useful mode as it can switch to image transfer mode and back. I find it useful for selfie or vlogging recordings. Playback includes an extensive raw conversion menu with EV adjustments, the ability to add a film simulation, the grain effect, adjust white balance, and the four Q adjustments. Firmware 2 added the ability to record a voice memo, but first it must be activated from the playback menu, then hold the front button, wait until recording starts, and record. The image will have a voice memo button, press the front button to play. The voice memo is saved on the card as a WAV file with the same file name as the image. There's a menu option to copy files from one card to another. Although it's not with user settings where you'd expect to find it, but on the Save Data menu, for copyright purposes, you can add your name and copyright info, which is saved with the photo's EXIF. The menu system is mostly well done, but the settings page is dense with lots of hidden features. There's lots to like about the My Menu feature, which enables me to create a custom menu of my most used settings. I like that it becomes the default, Fuji otherwise resets to page one, item one, nearly every time you access the menu. The trouble with my menu is that so many of the features I want to get to quickly, mostly those buried in the setup pages like format, can't be my menued. A few minor peculiarities. Inserting a memory card powers down the camera. The camera can't be USB powered, and the included battery charger has a power cable instead of a built-in plug and the battery grip charger requires a large power brick. The rough edges and a few missing features are easy to overlook, 
in this very satisfying package. Now, I'm not sure if there are more upgrades coming, but the X-T2 has already proven itself as a camera that improves with age.